Welcome, Stefano Eccari. He's our fourth Stephen Murray Distinguished Lecturer. He comes to us from the Astronomical Observatory in Bologna, and he's expert on formation and evolution of groups and clusters, focus on uh, physical properties of the ICM, and the use of clusters as a cosmological probe. Um, he began his astronomical career, as many people in X-ray astronomy do, with Andy Fabian in Cambridge, England. He was there from 1995 to 2001. And since he was in Cambridge, of course, it would be natural for him to write at least one paper on the Perseus cluster, which he did. One of his early papers is the ROSAT PSPC observations, the outer regions of the Perseus cluster. Naturally, even though he had left, the attraction of Cambridge and Perseus remained. So he still even came back and he co-authored a paper with Andy on the Chandra observations of Perseus. Um, from 2001 to 2004, he was at ESO. And one of the projects that he worked on there with Pierre Rosati was the Wide Field X-ray tel Telescope, WFXT. And I think, you think that's where his connection to Steve Murray um, began. Um, so that's his, uh, to WFXT, PRO, ESO. He still would like to have interest in X-ray surveys. And since 2004, he's been at the observatory in Bologna. His interests have broadened and they span all the wavelengths from radio, naturally at Bologna, to X-ray, expertise in ICM observations, gravitational lensing, radio studies, and SE analysis. And his talk, if he hasn't changed it since he gave it to us, his talk will be on the mass in galaxy clusters from S X-ray and SE observables. I give you Stefano. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Akos, for inviting me. To, to present uh, stuff that we have done recently, and I'm very happy to present you. And uh, I just realized that probably the things that I would like to, to touch and to describe you are really too much, and I, my only hope that uh, you will be not become exhausted before me. So um, let me start uh, saying that uh, the line motive, so uh, the fear rouge of all my uh, other work that I'm going to report to you will be on uh, galaxy clusters. <coughs> We see here a slow and picture of a comma. Let's see. Oh, doesn't how to switch on what I have to do? Because now it's switch off. I cannot see. Yeah. <coughs> okay, you have here the two uh, central galaxies in interaction. You have the same picture on different scale uh, as observed from Rosat in X ray. And here in Planck. Basically, what you observe here is uh, mostly here are cold baryons that represent, uh, let's say, 10, 20 percent of the total baryon budget of a galaxy cluster, whereas 80 percent of most of the baryons are in form of uh, optically thin, completely ionized plasma that is uh, basically just hydrogen and helium with few components of a few contribution of uh, other metals. And uh, this uh, is uh, the, the emission that they produce is just uh, that we observe in X-ray is due to the Brennstrahlung emission. And uh, this same plasma is responsible to, to distort the CMB photos by inverse Compton and to produce uh, the Sunya Zedovich effect that we observe in this Planck image of the same cluster. So we know from... Uh, from uh, uh, first principle, if you want, and from numerical simulation, that the gravity, how gravity forms structures, and how they can evolve in a present cosmological scenario. But still, uh, we have uh, not completely under control of the uh, counterpart, of the baryonic counterpart of these structures. So we need uh, any way to understand them deeply to 
fully appreciate uh, how the dark matter distributes and uh, how we can use galaxy cluster as a cosmological proxy because they trace so nicely the mass function, in particularly in the regime of the halos at above 10 to 14 solar masses. But of course, most of, the gravitational, most of the gravitational potential cannot be mapped directly, apart if you use some optical proxy or X-ray proxy. The problem that we are facing here is the fact that presently, we can really map very well the inner part of a galaxy cluster, let's say region at 2500 over density with respect to the critical density of the universe. And we can, this is uh, more or less 30% uh, of the viral radius uh, of uh, cluster halo. And this is a present limit uh, of Chandra, uh, apart a few exceptions. You can extend uh, for a, a reasonable redshift uh, still the observation uh, within uh, a reasonable amount of time up to R500 that characterize basically the emission of over 70% of a virial radius, but we are still speaking about 30% of the total volume of galaxy clusters. And this is uh, done now with uh, Chandra, with XMM. Suzaku can push, the, the Japanese satellite can push the observation a bit far from uh, closing to, close to the R200, but we are really, really far from this kind of picture. You have here numerical simulation where you show the R200 region and where you start to appreciate how the accretion of the baryons from the field occurs on, on the galaxy cluster. And indeed, this is a, a very hard task for X-ray to, to address with the present uh, instruments. This is a, uh, uh, just uh, Bill mentioned our interaction with, uh, with Steve uh, with, uh, about the W Field X ray telescope that was one of the candidates to try to address specifically uh, the new X ray sky uh, after ROSAT and, and also to address specifically the mapping of the outskirts of galaxy clusters. And this simulation that was done just to study the feasibility with WFXT of, uh, on, uh, on characterizing the cluster outskirts show you in black uh, the total integrated counts coming from uh, a region close to R200, so the virial region that characterizes the, the cluster, the overdensity in galaxy cluster from the field, and, uh, uh, and uh, the different components that contribute to the total counts that you observe. Basically, you have uh, two, uh, at low energy, below 2 kV, you are dominated by the galactic halo and the local bubble, that represent uh, as, uh, the dominant part of emission, uh, let's say, around 1 kV. Then you have uh, some residual cosmic X-ray background, so all the IGN and groups that are not really resolved. And this is still dominant uh, above uh, around 2 kV. Then you have a particle background that is uh, instrumental background uh, due to the electronics and uh, to the properties of the, instrument, of the instruments that focalize the X-ray photons that become dominant, uh, let's say, above uh, 3, 4, 5 kV, and then you have your source here in red. So basically one out of the 10, 100 counts that you receive from this region are from your cluster. The rest is just, let's say, background noise. And the problem is to try to characterize the emission of this source against all these contaminants. Now, just after Planck started to make observations routinely on, uh, on of X-ray of the um, galaxy cluster, we start to appreciate the fact that uh, Z as well can contribute significantly to study how the plasma is distributed uh, across the, all the video region. This is a coma exposure of, uh, obtained with Planck. This is the region that characterizes uh, uh, R500, and, the, and this is almost uh, two times R500. And you see that uh, the, the integrated the signal that you receive, the Compton parameter that is nothing else but uh, the integral line, line of the side of the pressure associated to the plasma, is able to map uh, uh, the, the emission up to a significant fraction of the virial radius, basically up to the virial radius. And another interesting uh, property of the AZ uh, signal is that it's almost independent for redshift. So, you are not to, to face uh, the uh, X-ray dimming of uh, that, uh, that goes proportional to the 1 plus Z to the power of 4 that kill most of the emission for a high Rechi system, assuming uh, that uh, the uh, scanning relation that relate to luminosity and temperature, for instance, are in some ways similar and there is not a boost of luminosity at high redshift. 
Anyway, what is important to understand here is the fact that uh, the Z signal, that as I said is the integral of the pressure along the line of sight of, uh, of the plasma, can be used as a very efficient proxy of uh, physical uh, properties of, uh, in, of a cluster region around R200 and, uh, and anyway above the region that uh, routinely can be mapped with X-ray. So all this information can be used now to address specifically how we can measure the mass in galaxy cluster. This is the holy grail for, uh, to do cosmology with galaxy cluster, characterize the total mass as it is distributed inside the cluster halo. You can apply directly, if you have good statistics, the hydrostatic equilibrium equation that assume that the gas is in hydrostatic equilibrium. Basically, all the plasma has to be thermalized. And all the energy left in form of kinetic energy of turbulence or bulk motion has to be assumed to be uh, negligible with respect to the total thermal energy that, uh, after the collapse, uh, thermalizes inside the cluster potential. Basically, the, the, the static equilibrium equation tells you that you need to know the temperature profile at uh, each radius that you want to map, and then you also have to uh, address specifically to characterize at the best the gradient in gas density and gas temperature profile. So it's very, it needs a lot of counts, it needs a lot of statistics uh, to characterize at the best the temperature and the gas density profile. Otherwise, uh, you can use a scan relation to relate uh, some of your observable, like temperature, gas mass, luminosity of YX, the computant parameter, uh, in both obtained in X-ray and in AZ. And you can apply known relation between this quantity, these observed quantities and the mass, to try to address which is the total mass associated to the system. Of course, this relation needs a calibration, and the calibration can be performed with a different and external data set. But let's, see, well, let's start to, to focus now, try to combine this piece of information that I provide you so far. So, characterizing the outskirts, try to recover the mass, how we can do now combining X-ray and Z. To introduce a very recent work, I need to go back a couple of years ago when with uh, Dominic Eckert we started this project that uh, used uh, still ROSAT uh, X-ray images to recover the gas density. ROSAT uh, has uh, great advantages with respect to uh, nowadays instruments just because uh, make a observation with a very large field of view and with very low background. So the two things help uh, in particular to characterize a very bright nearby source uh, up to the a significant fraction of the VR radius. So you have here and, and uh, ROSAT combined with a Planck measurement of a Z effect. The Planck, as I said, provide you the integration, of the, the integral of the Compton parameter provide you directly the pressure associated to the plasma, the combination of the two, just for the perfect gas law, give you all the physical information that you need to recover both of the physical state of the, of the plasma and the total mass, and how the total mass distributed inside the cluster halo. Because uh, you can measure directly the temperature without uh, any spectroscopic measurement of the temperature using X-ray data, just dividing the pressure that you measure from a Z by the density that you measure, for instance, from ROSAT. A reminder that ROSAT has not uh, significant uh, um, uh, spectroscopic sensitivity to provide a very nice temperature because it basically was sensitive up to uh, uh, 2 kilo electron volt. And, uh, and then you can measure the entropy that is a, a quantity, the astrophysical entropy that is a quantity that characterizes immediately what is uh, the thermal state of the gas, uh, if it's cooling, uh, if uh, it received the feedback, uh, and which is the state of the gas that is still accreting from the, uh, from the, um, from the outskirts in, uh, of, the, of the cluster. And then you can apply directly the static equilibrium equation and recover a measurement of the mass. So basically, with these two quantities, the pressure that you get from uh, the thermal, uh, from uh, AZ, and the density that you get from ROSAT, uh, Combining the two, you have uh, immediately all the information uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, distribution, uh, radial distribution of all these properties. And this is what uh, we have done, for instance, uh, recovering the gas mass fraction. This is against the WMAP7 constraint. We, say, we def distinguish between uh, two kinds of uh, data set, the, the one that we consider more relaxed, the so-called cool core systems, 
So system that have a, a, a cool core, meaning that the, the gas tend to radiate in a very efficient way on scale that are lower the Hubble time, in particular in the central region, against non-cool core, non -cool core objects that tend to be more disturbed and could be a good representative of a system that are still in formation. And uh, you see that uh, generally the cool core system uh, tend to, on average, uh, to be uh, offset in respect to the measurement of the gas mass fraction that you measure in no cool core system. And the reason for that uh, could be due to hydrostatic equilibrium duration or clamping. So what we observe, remember that what we observe in X-ray is just the gas density to the square because it's a brain stratum, so it is uh, the Coulomb interaction of the protons in the, uh, of electrons in the Coulomb field of the protons. And uh, it goes proportional to the density square. So what you map generally, the super brightness is the density square. And when you try to convert the de uh, the, uh, this in a density, you're still facing with the fact that if it's glassed, uh, if a gas is clamped, you are map. You have not a direct proxy of uh, average density, but more of average density to the square. And so this could be an effect that propagated through the measurement of a system that are more relaxed or more disturbed. And to address specifically in a better way this, uh, this issue, uh, we uh, ask uh, time to XMM and we, we obtain in AO14, and we get this very large program that uh, is a 1.2 megasecond exposure of a 13 object, very massive system in the ratio range of 0 0.04.1. So uh, the idea is uh, to map with a four exposure of 25 kilosecond each, uh, the, uh, this very massive system up to R200, so up to the VR radius, and to combine this with a, a, a new analysis of the Planck data. The sample was selected in such a way that uh, they have a very signal to noise in Planck. Basically, they have the system with the highest signal to noise in Planck, means that are among the most massive systems in the nearby universe. And a new analysis was performed to extract the Compton parameter profile and so to recover the pressure profile. We have now two papers that describe the sample and the first object that was analyzed to probe a sort of feasibility study to prove that what we want to address can be done really uh, on 2132 that has been submitted uh, last month. So just to show you a collage of uh, this exposure, these are the XMM uh, star, uh, observation were completed in December, and uh, you observe here, you have here the map of the four exposure for all the system, plus uh, overplotted, you have a contour plot for, uh, from a Planck uh, measurement. So you, have, you see that most of the system are relaxed, but what is also interesting, relaxed meaning that they have a very well-defined center and a very peak emission around the center, but it was also, what is also interesting is the fact that uh, now we can really start to appreciate uh, how the accretion of the clamps uh, of the mass of order 10 to 14 or more happen also on this scale. Remember that we have prediction from numerical simulation about uh, how the mass accretion is occurring. It's still missing completely in the literature any study about the mass accretion galaxy cluster that is, uh, I think, a very Interesting topics also because as we started to be demonstrated that this accretion rate could be related, of course, to the cosmological background, so can be used also as a cosmological test. Anyway, what we start to appreciate is the fact that we have a lot of matter that more or less clamped that is accreting from the suburbs of galaxy clusters, and this information are mapped both in X-ray and with SZ. Let me just show uh, you uh, a more detailed study that we did last year with, on Abel 2142 about this accreting clamp. This is a, um, a 10 to 15 solar mass system. And uh, what we uh, started to appreciate is the fact that this object, that is 10 to 14 solar masses, tend to be uh, disrupted during, during, uh, for, by ram striping during uh, is, uh, is falling in, uh, in the galaxy cluster. We have uh, we, we can, we can ma make a direct measurement of the temperature and density of the structure, and so we can start to, uh, um, to quantify the kind of time uh, that it takes uh, to, to be disrupted and to, be, uh, to completely thermalize inside the uh, cluster field. 
And uh, just to remind you that this kind of object from prediction, from numerical simulation, or hydrodynamical simulation, are predicted to occur one per cluster, basically, over a cluster region. And probably we really identify this one. Of course, this is a single object, but the idea now is with a 13 object to play a bit of statistics, also in characterizing the a sort of a, a clumps and mass function or clumps luminosity function of the system that are accreting around galaxy clusters. So this is a, 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 the paper that we submitted to show that we are re really able to recover all the profile of the physical quantity of interest. This is a, uh, the X-ray image with the four different XMM pointing. We've highlighted here the region from where a local background is estimated because it's a very critical for this kind of study to characterize, as, a sh uh, as I show you in uh, one of the first slides, the level of background. And uh, at least uh, there are, we are confident that in the, re in the map that we are sampling here between 0.7 and 1.2 kiloelectron volt, uh, we are able to control uh, the, all the components of the background at the 5% level. And this is uh, the minimal request to try to come out with a very nice and, and a robust constraint about the thermal properties of the gas in these regions. This is instead the Planck um, emission. You have here the beam associated to the Planck exposure. Uh, of course, uh, this limits a lot in particular about the reconstruction of the profile in the internal part. We are speaking about uh, uh, between 5 and 10 arc minutes resolution for Planck, but uh, we are able at least to, to recover the, the, the shape of the profile up to R200 without strong contamination from the PSF. So here you have uh, still the X-ray image, and this is a Voronoi tessellation reconstruction of the same image. Why we did this? Okay, this is a part of, a, of a, a discussion that is going on about how we can characterize the physical properties once you know that your emission can be contaminated from clumpiness. This goes back by, to the work by Zuraleva and Churazov and the collaborators. Then in numerical simulation, we start to appreciate the fact that if you just plot the density and temperature of the given radius in a given annulus, you have that the distribution of this quantity are log normal in some way with a very strong uh, tail that is uh, represented by the most clamped gas. And they c that make a lot of a contribution because this is a gas at highest density. So if you just make an average of the properties uh, of the gas uh, in a given annulus, you are definitely biased, biased towards higher value. We have uh, demonstrated in some way that uh, using instead, uh, knowing that uh, a log normal distribution is a good representation about the distribution of the density and temperature that you can measure in a given annulus, we started to use a sort of medium measurement. And so we apply this Voronoi tessellation just to characterize the single elements that will be used to reconstruct a given radius, a sort of log normal distribution. And this is what we did. And so we have a median we recover at each annulus of the distribution of a single element, uh, so the, 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 in this case, the super brightness elements, we recover and fit the log normal distribution. We fit the median value. We estimate the median value for this distribution that we know is uh, the less biased quantity that could represent the overall uh, properties of the single phase gas at that radius. And then uh, we compare with the median. So we started uh, this way just to, to try to find out a solution to the, to the fact that all the emission that we have can be in some way affected from clumpiness. And this is a reasonable way to correct for it. And indeed, what we obtain here, that is of a super brightness uh, uh, profile, here in blue you have uh, the mean, in red uh, the same super brightness profile obtained using the median of a distribution at each radius, the difference can be ascribed completely to the clumpiness of the gas. So we have a sort of an average value, an average value for the profile of the clumpiness that is uh, here quoted here. This ratio, this, the square root of C is nothing else but uh, the square root of uh, gas density to the square divided by the gas density, the mean gas density to the steel to the square. So it's corrected by the fact that uh, the, we are observing X-ray emission due to the that is directly proportional to density squared. And uh, we come out with this uh, 
profile that give uh, you an indication of uh, how much your emission is biased by the fact that the cluster is not smoothed but tend to be clamped on small scale. And the factor of the correction is in the order of 10, 15 percent. And this is a, a first very near, near uh, very neat result because we are able to reconstruct this kind of clampiness profile up to R200. And this is a, probably the first time that you have a direct evidence that the gas that you observe can be biased by some quantity that is still under control, in the, but uh, you need to quantify in some way. And this is a way to quantify it. So now, we, combining also now Planck data, we can uh, reconstruct independently from any spectral measurement the temperature, so divide the pressure that you have from Planck by the density that you get from XMM. And you have here uh, the two profiles in uh, yellow here using the mean, the median, and in blue using the, uh, the, the mean. So you see that there is a still an offset. And then in red you have uh, the temperature reconstructed using instead the the actual spectra that you, you can measure with XMM. The agreement is nice. We have a still offset here uh, on this point uh, that uh, is difficult to quantify, but is uh, still a uh, two sigma level. And uh, is encouraging because uh, we are proving here that uh, in some way, independently from any knowledge about the spectroscopy properties of your plasma, you are able to recover the temperature in some way. So it's a, a temperature that has all the properties that are needed to reconstruct, for instance, a pressure or to reconstruct... Oh, yeah, let me just skip a bit. Sorry, we come to this in a moment. So we, all the properties that are needed to reconstruct the physical quantity of interest. Just to, to make uh, clear what, uh, that we are really making uh, um, a good job here in trying to characterize the plasma, these are the actual spectra with all the... Uh, model component uh, at a different radii. These are very close to R5, R200, to the Vera radius. And you see here that uh, your signal that is here in, in red, the cluster, tend to compete strongly against the, the CSB not resolved that is in, in yellow and against the particle background that you are in blue. Remember that uh, uh, XMM have uh, several fluorescent line, uh, internal fluorescent line like aluminum and copper that appear here in the particle background spectra. These are the temperature profile, and uh, one note of interest is the fact that the same outskirts were mapped also with Suzaku, and just to make clear, this is just also to, to emphasize a bit, which is one of the main limitations in uses Suzaku to do this kind of work. First, uh, Suzaku have a poor special resolution, meaning uh, something of order to arc minutes, but uh, it's difficult to map uh, in a sort of azimutally all the properties of the plasma. So you can do, as was done for Perseus and here for uh, 2142, you can just choose uh, one direction, one arm to characterize the gas along that direction, like the northwest region. And so you see that uh, we are able to reproduce overall the behavior of, uh, of the plasma uh, as measured from uh, Suzaku along this direction, but this behavior doesn't reproduce really the overall behavior of the plasma in your cluster. So this is a, just a, a, a mention that also all the general conclusion that can be drawn from a Suzaku exposure if they are done along a preferential, preferential direction have to be uh, taken uh, with a, a bit of caution just because it cannot be really representative over overall, uh, let's say, mean properties of the plasma. And another nice result is the fact that we are able to map uh, the abundance up to R500, and uh, we start to, to appreciate uh, a sort of decrease that is expected, but uh, ne was ne almost never observed directly, uh, given the overall um, uh, budget, uh, metal uh, metallicity budget of the cluster. And so, as I said, we have now all the profile that can be combined to get uh, important information like the entropy profile or like uh, the uh, total mass profile. My entropy profile, I just mentioned here that uh, there is now a long-standing issue about uh, how the be uh, profile behaves uh, in the outskirts, uh, if they flatten for any reason, or uh, if they are still following uh, the prediction from a gravitational collapse that is here indicated in, in, in blue or black line. 
And uh, we come out that uh, once you make a proper uh, correction for the clumpiness, so we use uh, the median as a representative of the distribution of uh, gas properties uh, at given radius, the agreement with, uh, with a prediction when gravitational collapse uh, are very nice and we win, we win uh, one sigma. If instead we still represent the density using the mean quantity, we have a deviation. So meaning that most of the clamping, most of the deviation from gravitational collapse prediction, at least for 2142, can be ascribed to the unresolved clampiness of the gas. And this could be very problematic, very uh, um, an issue that can be difficult, in a difficult way resolved using Suzaku, that was the first instrument to point out that the entropy tend to flatten when you move outside. You can partially justify it just because Suzaku is not able to resolve all the clamp structure that we can resolve, for instance, with XMM. Another nice thing is that you now can recover the mass profile up to R200, and uh, you can compare with independent measurement, for instance, using a weak lensing in measurement on, uh, on kinematics of galaxies, uh, and the agreement is very nice. So it will, it will be interesting to, to see how these properties behave in all the, our sample, because definitely in this case, uh, it doesn't make, uh, it doesn't left any space for any hydrostatic bias, meaning that uh, once you do, uh, um, you recover the properties, uh, uh, paying uh, particular attention on the clumpiness, uh, the agreement with an uh, uh, independent measurement of the mass uh, up to R200 are pretty nice, uh, and the, any tension uh, almost disappear. And uh, I would like uh, just to advertise that uh, on the outskirts, uh, we have a dedicated session, a symposium, of the next uh, European Week uh, Astronomic Society, uh, space, uh, space Society meeting uh, that will be held in, uh, in Athens uh, uh, next July. This is a uh, uh, myself and uh, Dominique uh, are the coordinators, uh, and uh, please consider to submit an abstract by uh, mid of March. And uh, the idea is uh, just to do a two-day session in uh, discussing intensively about the exploring of uh, uh, galaxy cluster outskirts. So, on the mass, now so let's move uh, to, to see uh, which, uh, which is the status about, uh, I, I mentioned before, but uh, I, I now try to discuss deeper about the hydrostatic bias. So it uh, has been recognized in, from several authors that if you independently measure uh, weak lensing, uh, basically because the weak lensing are able to probe the distribution of a, of a potential up to uh, R500 and above, and you measure the hydrostatic mass, there is a, a tension. In CLASH, that has been a, a quite large, intense, uh, um, uh, dedicated program with HST to map uh, with 16 independent filters uh, the, uh, the region around 25 very massive objects, just to study both strong and weak length in signal and reconstruct from them the concentration and the mass distribution. We are able to make a, a comparison that we did using independent Chandra and XMM data set, and we compare with uh, weak lensing only, or once uh, the CLASH team combining weak lensing and uh, strong, uh, in particular to map the inner part region of, of the mass distribution. So we come out with uh, uh, contradictory results, meaning that uh, at the present stage, uh, looking at, uh, at the same physical radius uh, and uh, using independent mass measurement, uh, we are uh, in the range that uh, the hydrostatic bias, so meaning the X-ray mass against the weak lensing mass, could range between 0.7 up to 1. The error are in the order of 10%. Anyway, what we are measuring is something that is not, is not yet conclusive about the status of, of the kind of measurement that we can, we can do on, on the mass reconstruction. We know on X-ray side that uh, Part of the tension, at least what the numerical sim simulation tend to suggest, can be uh, ascribed to these two components. We suspect that alpha of error budget uh, come from neglected gas motion, so the fact that we are making a strong assumption <coughs> that uh, the gas is in the static equilibrium, and half of this can also come from inhomogeneities in the temperature map. So I quote here the, um, the how you can measure uh, different values of, uh, of the temperature using, depending on how you can be contaminated uh, from your source, uh, and the tension tend to disappear once uh, 
you use a sort of mass weighted against the spectroscopic measurement. But the important things here is the fact that uh, numeric, the, the, the inhomogeneities uh, that can be still not very well recovered in X-ray images can be responsible up to half of the total ba error budget that could affect the mass reconstruction. This is a, a graph that I want to summarize the, the state of the art up to a few years ago. So uh, basically numerical simulation and uh, uh, observational data that are here put together, the numerical simulation are here in red and purple and the yellow and uh, the numerical data are in blue and uh, purple in a darkish side, are on, uh, on the same level of attention of claiming that uh, X-ray mass against weak lensing mass could be biased by 10% or so. We have to remind you that uh, anyway, the hydrostatic equilibrium holds locally. This is something that uh, is sometimes misunderstood, but uh, meaning that if you are able to resolve a region on your cluster, a given radius that can be, for any reason, assumed to be relaxed, you can apply locally by the static equilibrium. And so you can uh, play a lot in trying to masking any evidence of uh, have uh, inhomogeneities in your temperature distribution or inhomogeneities or, um, or, or due to the, any merging that uh, could, uh, could happen in, uh, in, uh, in the region that you selected. And another point that you have to take into account is the fact uh, that uh, the barium fraction that we measure in galaxy cluster using, for instance, hydrostatic mass and using gas mass that are very well measured from X-ray only data meaning that we are able to recover gas mass in the order of a few percent, uh, is, uh, is very does it match very well the, the, what we should expect from a cosmological consideration. So if you use, uh, so if you consider galaxy cluster as a closed, a closed box, basically the baryon fraction should just reproduce the ratio between the baryon cosmic density and the matter density. And this is indeed the case, meaning that uh, there is not much space for any strong variation in your total mass measurement, because the total mass measurement goes here at, in the de denominator. So if you are biased strongly in your mass reconstruction, this uh, match uh, should not be satisfied anyway. Uh, this is another slide that we want to advertise a work that we started, a project that we started in Bologna with uh, Mauro Sereno. And there was a, 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 with a purpose, specific purpose, uh, to try to compare mass in literature. So there, uh, there has been a, a lot of production in uh, recent years in, uh, in reconstructive mass using hydrodynamical, uh, um, hydrostatic equilibrium equation or using uh, weak length in mass, uh, weak length in signal. And uh, we started now to consider we can try to compare this measurement to see if there is a general picture, if we have really have a consistent view of uh, which is the static bias and which is the bias that is uh, affecting uh, also different sample in lensing or different sample in X-ray uh, data. And, uh, um, and in particular, which are uh, the scatter that affect uh, this measurement. Because once you have a proper description of the bias and the scatter that uh, relate to this quantity, you can in some way control it and you can, using, uh, to, you can use them to, uh, to propagate the, the, this, uh, this estimate to calibrate, for instance, the scary relation. Is, uh, uh, just to mention that uh, this is uh, a plot in which uh, three uh, of, uh, of, um, four uh, of the most popular sample of uh, um, galaxy cluster measurement done with uh, uh, weak lensing are compared one against each other, so clash, locus, weight, the giant, and CCCP. And you see that at, at R500, they are still off, they can be still off by 30% or so. This depends a lot on the kind of selection, in particular the background, the galaxy background selection is performed. There are, Clash is definitely one of the best in terms of data selection because using 16 filters is really able to distinguish between cluster member and galaxy in the background. There are more limitations, for instance, in locus, but anyway, what we are presenting here is an evidence that also on the weak lens inside, there is still variation, there is a, still a large scatter in reproducing uh, the total mass in galaxy clusters. And this is, uh, could affect also the fact that if you use an external sample and you make a choice, for instance, weight the giant or locus or clash to calibrate your data, 
you have to consider that you should bring with, uh, with uh, inside your error budget uh, any uh, uh, bias that could affect the sample itself. This is uh, the same plot that show the hydrostatic bias from numerical simulation and uh, comparing uh, different uh, sample. What is interesting now, we are quantifying this bias and also we try to uh, calibrate in the scatter that is associated to the bias. But uh, what is more interesting is the fact that now we have a, we developed a tool by basically Mauro Sereno did, did most of his work to try also to, uh, to, to include most of the systematics that could affect the mass reconstruction using samples and using scatter relation. So this is a, a basically a hierarchical model that uh, try to contain all the statistical error selection effect, uh, edit on a more quick bias, and then time evolution in particular for, what, for the component of the scatter. So once you have a model that includes all this quantity, you are in, in, a, in a way to produce more robust prediction in terms of the total mass, in particular if you try to do either an internal simul uh, calibration or an external calibration. What I mean is uh, external calibration using different data set, uh, internal calibration use uh, the subsample in, in your system for which you have uh, uh, independent mass measurement that you believe. And for example, we did this uh, for, uh, for Planck uh, and we did also for, uh, um, for, uh, for the slow and red mapper. And uh, you see that for a subsample of those, uh, we, we have available some weak length in mass, so we can do an internal calibration and we can recover for all this system, propagating properly all the uh, systematics that could affect the propagation of this quantity, the mass. And uh, for instance, uh, in the Planck, uh, when we do this exercise with Planck, we notice that with respect to the mass predicted from Sunil Zeldovich, uh, using uh, some scatter relation uh, calibrated basically on XMM data, and we compare with our prediction from weak lensing, uh, we have uh, a sort of tension that can be ascribed partially also to hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium bias, but also to something that could be uh, uh, more subtle to, to be uh, considered that could be also the kind of calibration that could affect the, 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 the Planck measurement. Let's move now to uh, to next step. So we have uh, introduced the static uh, equilibrium equation. We have uh, introduced that this can be done for a, a, a good set of data for which you can recover properly the gas density temperature profile. And then uh, we uh, started to appreciate the fact that to apply the viscary relation to calibrate the viscary relation, you need uh, a, a proper uh, calibrator. Or you need uh, to control all the bias and scatter that affect uh, your, uh, your uh, in the zero point, your calibration. But now uh, we, uh, we, mm, we have to consider the fact that in the, we need this, ca this calibration at some point to uh, make a cosmology, as Alexei did for uh, his sample and uh, as uh, uh, Irosita is going to do uh, soon uh, one, uh, once uh, 10 to 4 galaxy cluster will be observed, uh, you need to relate uh, some proxy like the X-ray uh, flux uh, that you measure in this map uh, to the total mass. And this is an exercise that uh, we are now in the process to do using uh, XXL data. So XXL uh, is uh, one of the ultimate survey, if it has been presented as the ultimate survey in uh, using XMM Newton, are 10 kilosecond exposure of two fields of a 25 degree uh, square degree each. And uh, um, this is the uh, X, uh, XXL South, uh, and uh, this is compared to the uh, similar region observed with ROSAT. We are pushing here with XMM the observation uh, of two order of magnitude uh, below the flux limit in ROSAT, so very, very close to the, to the limit that will be reached by Erosita. And uh, uh, what is interesting here is uh, the fact that uh, just recently, last January, uh, were submitted uh, the leader of the PI of this uh, project is Marguerite Pierre uh, in Paris, in Saclay, and uh, just last month we were submitted uh, the first series of paper that uh, present the XXL data and the XXL analysis of this data. Uh, what uh, is interesting to note that uh, over these 25 degrees square degrees, so we expect to observe about 500 galaxy clusters. In the first series of paper, we present just the 100 
uh, brightest. And uh, uh, we, uh, among the other uh, results that were obtained, in particular by Florian Paco, is the discovery of uh, five new supercluster galaxies uh, along this uh, two uh, region to the north, to the south, and to the north. And then uh, uh, some constraint about the properties of galaxy cluster that I show you here. This is an image of one of the supercluster detected by Florian. This is uh, what Paul Gears and Ben Morgan in Birmingham did to characterize the luminosity temperature relation for this uh, um, uh, 100 object, the brightest 100 object in XXL, and showing that uh, they, show, they are, tend to agree also in terms of uh, uh, um, ratio evolution with uh, self-similar prediction. So, meaning that uh, if you scale a cluster as function of mass at different redshift, they behave uh, similarly. And then uh, with Dominique Eckert, we reconstructed the mass, uh, gas mass profile, and so using uh, the luminosity against the weak lensing mass relation that was calibrated against uh, 30 of this object, we were able to measure the gas mass fraction. And indeed, we find out that uh, our gas mass fraction tend to be lower than, uh, than expected, significantly lower. We suspect that something is still going on about the mass calibration and uh, the, how we can are able to recover the, the total uh, mass using a weak lensing mass that were available at the moment. But this is, will be part of the work that uh, will be um, done in, uh, in the next future because now we are ready working, uh, ready to work on the next uh, set of papers and ta start to approach the cosmological analysis of this uh, entire data set. And uh, this introduced me to uh, Tuatina. Tuatina is, uh, um, will be, uh, is expected to, to be the next generation uh, ESA uh, satellite. Uh, to be clear, the concept has been adopted from, uh, from ESA as the hot and energetic universe that have to be addressed with some instrument. Tina is still not adopted. will be adopted uh, presumably in a couple of years after the phase A then will be completed. And uh, the, the idea is to have an observatory, in particular to address specifically part of the question that I already raised during my talk. And to do that, uh, you have uh, this 12-meter telescope uh, with, uh, out of a focal plane, uh, two main instruments. That here is uh, a wide field imager uh, with uh, basically a 40 arc minutes uh, uh, field of view. This is a, a, a sort of a, is a RCCDs that will be developed at Mass Planck. And then uh, you have uh, an integral field unit, an X-ray integral field unit with a spectral resolution of 2.5 electron volt but a uh, uh, field of view of uh, just five arc minute. We are speaking here of a collecting area of about uh, two square meter at one kV and uh, 0.25 um, square meter at uh, six kV. So we are speaking about uh, a factor of 10 higher, in particular at low energy, uh, a more effective area with respect to XMMPN. So what we can do this specifically for, the, uh, for what concerns the formation and the evolution of galaxy cluster, we concentrate more on the formation. We can start really with just 100 kilosecond exposure to characterize at the best the properties of the plasma TAR-200. This is a simulation that we did with uh, Gabriel Pratt that, uh, and uh, with Dominique that uh, Altogether, we are the responsible for uh, all the um, astrophysics of galaxy cluster uh, working group. And uh, as, uh, as you appreciate in the previous picture, you have here the Tata spectrum in black, and then the several component of the background or foreground, and then you have in red the emission from the galaxy clusters. With a reasonable strategy and taking under control, uh, in particular, the reproducibility of the background, we are able to characterize uh, at a few percent level uh, temperature density, and metallicity. In particular, about the metallicity, uh, we know at the moment very few, very little about the properties of the metal budget of a galaxy cluster is formed and evolved as function of cosmic time. This is a recent work that I done in collaboration with uh, Silvano Molendi and, uh, and others uh, in, uh, that uh, address specifically this case uh, uh, using XMM data. And uh, at the moment, I think this is one of the best collection of uh, uh, measurement of the metal content of galaxy cluster resolved uh, both as, as function of radius and as function of cosmic time. We have uh, evidence of uh, 
radial dependence of the metal content of galaxy cluster as function also of a redshift. And, uh, but this uh, kind of uh, decrease uh, that could be very interesting to note uh, uh, with a very nice and very strong constraint because it can tell us a lot about uh, how this gas is polluted by supernova activity as function of cosmic time. The evolution, as I said, of the matter content is very poorly constrained. We are speaking about uh, into the evolution at two sigma level. And uh, indeed, as Silvano has discussed very recently, if you just uh, consider the, really the, all the overall uncertainties that affect uh, the, um, the, the reconstruction of the properties of a plasma at R500, we are facing with uh, a meta distribution, uh, let's say at R200, with this kind of uncertainties. We just know that it's something below 0.3. This is really what we can really uh, conclude about uh, the general properties of ICM in terms of the metal content. And one of the dramatic things that will be faced also from Athena is the fact that if you want to characterize the metal distribution, so how the gas, for instance, is polluted from either from an external, from a critical material or from internal star formation, you need to control the background level at very high significance, meaning that you need a few percent of the reproducibility of the background, so meaning that you need, you, you, are, you need to know a very high precision how the background is over your CCDs and which are the component, the, the overall component that make the background that you observe at a 2% level. And just to remind you, just 40 years ago, there was the first detection of iron line emission that is the most of the best proxy for metal content in galaxy clusters. So the K-line was observed with Ariel 5, and the paper was submitted on 12 February of the 76, just to celebrate that this kind of science started just 40 years ago. And another aspect that Athena can address is, as I mentioned before, we assume, using, for instance, the static equilibrium equation, that the gas is completely thermalized. But is it really the case? And from now, from what we know now, we, we are able to reproduce the super brightness uh, map. We can infer something uh, like uh, Eugene Churaz of uh, try in recent years to infer from the fluctuation that you observe in the super brightness map also, which has, which is the, the energy associated to turbulence. But definitely we need uh, us to reconstruct a map where we trace directly a sort of a mass weighted velocity of the plasma. And this can be done with uh, XIFU, with uh, the X-ray integral field unit on board of Athena, because uh, with XIFU in a field of five by five arc minutes, uh, in each pixel, basically, we can infer, uh, we can get a spectrum. And from this spectrum, looking at the broadening of the emission line of the, to the shift of a centroid, we can characterize uh, motion in the order of few hundred kilometers per second. And this is definitely one of the major goals uh, for Athena. So 124, so last uh, five minutes, okay. So let's uh, just mention this, that uh, uh, also working on data, I like also to, to play some games on, on papers and uh, try to, to come out with uh, about the scalar relation, how we can try to generalize this scalar relation. At the moment, most of the information comes from using a single proxy like luminosity, gas mass, temperature, but if you want really to kill most of the scatter that uh, affect uh, your mass reconstruction given a proxy that is not uh, a perfect, uh, that is affected from statistical uncertainties and from systematic uncertainties, the suggestion that I have is uh, to go for a combination of observables. And for instance, if in the self-similar scenario you can probe that the luminosity, gas mass, and temperature, the exponent of this correlation uh, just uh, lay on a, a sort of fundamental plane. So you have a, 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 a constraint about uh, the kind of uh, exponent that uh, in the scary relation propagate through observable to the total mass. And uh, indeed, uh, you can just project uh, this quantity in the single plane and you recover easily over known scary relation. But what is more interesting uh, is the fact that you can expand this kind of work and think about that uh, not only the slope and the redshift evolution uh, of this power law between mass, total mass and observable are known, but uh, by uh, first principle, you, you have also the normalizations. 
And what is interesting is the fact that all this normalization contained in, in, inside physical information that can be used as a, as a parameter to be adjusted to satisfy all the observed properties. What I mean by that is that all the scanning relation that we know can be just written uh, intensively with, uh, with um, the dependence uh, on the of observer quantities with a given exponent, and then a normalization that depends basically on just three parameters, the clumpiness and the gas mass fraction, the slope of the pressure profile, and, uh, and that's all. Just this three parameter because I included also the clumpiness. And if you just use uh, observer relation, you can calibrate uh, this quantity. This is what you need to, to build your scalar relation, because you can assume the self-similar prediction in terms of exponent and in terms of a ratio evolution, and then just adjust uh, how the gas mass fraction and the slope of the, of the pressure profile depends on the mass. And so you come out with this very general form of equation from all the observed quantity in X-ray and uh, in uh, using a sunil zeldovich effect, and how, this, how they correlate to the total mass. So this is uh, the last slide is just a summary of what I discuss uh, in this talk. From simulation observation, we are understanding biases scattering in hydrostatic mass and weak lensing. And uh, we have now statistical tools that are robust enough uh, to model and to propagate more, most um, of the systematic effect that uh, affect our uh, uh, scanning relation. Combining X-ray and sunil zedovich profile is a very promising tool to try to recover clamping free uh, profiles of uh, interesting quantity like temperature, density, pressure, entropy, and total mass. And I would suggest that uh, a generalized and physical scalar relation can be now adopted, in particular if you want to address specifically the minimal uh, uh, reproduction of a total mass with a minimal scatter. Thank you. Say again, sorry, I missed it. Are you, the pressure information? So, okay, for this, better to go. So the pressure information give you directly, but the pressure is a density times temperature, okay? So if you go back in the in the static equilibrium equation, you need just to know the derivative of pressure. Once you know the derivative of pressure and you know the density, you have all the information that are needed to reconstruct your mass profile. And the pressure is obtained uh, uh, in two ways. You can do using X-ray because uh, you have a density and you have a spectroscopic temperature, or you can do using a sunil zeldovich effect because the Compton parameter is just the integral along the line of side of the pressure of the plasma. So you measure the Compton integral and then you deproject it along the line of side. And you, once you have this, uh, this information, you add all what you need. The, you mentioned clumpiness as a solution to uh, bring the curse of entropy up to the gravitational collapse. It still looks like there is a mismatch. So yeah. We, yeah, we believe that uh, there are still unresolved clumpiness also in XMM data, okay? Because uh, in particular when you, we are speaking about a resolution of the order of 15, 20 arc second, and uh, that means uh, on, uh, on the scale of interest about uh, 20 kiloparsec or so. So if, we, if uh, as we suspect, there are still clamps also on these scales, uh, we are missing it. Now. And uh, this is also what uh, numerical simulation tend to prefer. So we are still missing some, uh, some, um, some of the clamping, uh, the clamped gas, and this could uh, completely justify the, the remaining tension that we have with the gravitational collapse prediction. Yeah. What, what are their are there okay. Um, this is uh, 
we did uh, just one work at the moment on 2142, and we resolved. Uh, we are resolving the most massive system, so meaning a 10 to 14 solar massive system. Below that, we haven't uh, do any specific work. This is one of the two main targets for XCOP. One is to recover as the mutually average profile, the other one is to characterize the, the clamped gas, to characterize the, the clamps that we are able to resolve. From the first attempt, for instance, in Hydra A, that is one of the candidates, in one single exposure, we are able to resolve, uh, apart from point source, uh, tens of, of clamps that we have no idea what they are because uh, can be associated to the plasma, to the cluster, can be in background or in foreground, we don't know. Uh, the problem is that we are missing all the follow-up. We started some project to make some follow-up in optical to try to characterize this kind of structure, but uh, uh, will be, let's say it will be difficult at the moment to, to have a full answer in the next years or so. Because basically we can recover temperature and density still for the most massive ones. So we cannot really make a measurement of the temperature for all the resolved clamps that we have. So uh, could be a way, but we didn't investigate yet. So it's still premature to say what kind of uh, clamps we observe, we resolve. I was wondering if you could stack the clumps and compare that average temperature to the... Yeah, uh, is, uh, I mean, as I said, uh, this is just started as a project. So we, we, we are thinking several things to do. We already mentioned some of the of, um, of density, number density function that we would like to investigate in a work that we did with Franco Vaz a couple of years ago. And um, we can really do, is a completely... Uh, 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 new window that we are opening on this, because uh, apart from uh, the work that uh, Alexei did on uh, Abel 133 and 1795, I don't know, there are no many data for which you can really assemble a good sample of, uh, of a clamped structure and try to characterize this in a, in a more proper way. So, but uh, as I said, uh, the, we just collected the image last December and we try now to, to, to define a strategy to to come out with the best solution to address specifically the two things that I mentioned, average profile and the clamped structure. I actually have one more question. When you do the SZ measurements, you derive the pressure. You're doing averages around. As the gas gets clumpy, as the gas, these clumps then have, thermal, have, have non-thermal motions, what biases does that put into the pressures you derive from, from SZ? From AZ, um, I, I expect that, uh, the, I mean, should, uh, I mean, should be present in some way some, uh, some bias also from, uh, from any motion. I don't know if uh, we are able to resolve at, uh, with the present data. So uh, we expect some bias, but I think the strongest bias that uh, we, we, we could have in X, in, uh, in AZ, is a proper deconvolution by the PSF. This is definitely one of the issues. And, uh, and then uh, to face uh, properly, uh, to characterize properly the background, meaning the foreground of the galaxies and the CMB. In particular, if you want to map out to R200 and above it. And uh, Hervé is also working on this, and uh, I think they have a better suggestion on how to proceed in this way. I was wondering whether from the simulations there have been any estimates of, you know, as you go with function of radius, when things get, you see, when, if there are, you know, there are filaments and then there's space, empty space between them, or even, you know, clumpiness and the clumps are moving, whether, you know, there ought to be some biases, but I haven't seen anybody talking about that. No, in fact, I it. think it's, yeah, it's still a very, very new science, and so I think uh, no one has an answer properly for that. Any last questions? Nobody else wants to thank the panel again. Um, you showed the gas fraction. Uh, one of your very first slides. I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, the gas fraction? Uh, maybe it was.